An Introduction to Law and, Le and Legal Reasoning. Part 2. First of all, um, I want to make sure, and I think I've corrected the sound problems from the earlier, uh, but let's talk about the roots of our legal system. Let's go back in time. Uh, and remember, it's our legal system, which is an amalgamation, sadly, of only European tradition. Obviously, there's many other legal traditions out there in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, in uh, Oceania, and the like. But, per usual, uh, it's a form of cultural um, hegemony, if you will, hegemony. And our legal system, like many around us, uh, come out of um, European roots. So let's first of all talk about one of our roots, and that's the civil law system. The civil law system grew out of the Code of Justinian, and there's Justinian to the upper right. Um, he was considered the great lawgiver emperor, and of course the, uh, the history of many of the emperors of the Roman Empire had much to be uh, desired. Remember, Nero was also an emperor. Um, but what was the Code of Justinian? Well, what Justinian attempted to do was amalgamate those territories that fell under the Roman Empire. And what he did is sent out a group known as the Pandex, sent these individuals out. And what were they? Well, obviously, this is centuries and centuries before sociology, centuries and centuries before law uh, or legal practice. They were kind of like an amalgam of sociologists, legalists, maybe even early blooming uh, um, criminalists and political scientists. Well, the Pandics were observers, and they went out um, uh, among all the various ethnic groups that made up the uh, Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, the Roman Empire. And they spe especially looked at the Germanic tribes because much of the territory that Rome conquered was in the area of Gaul, which is now France, uh, Germania, which is obviously Germany, outwards to Romania, Poland, up uh, England, Wales, and up to the Scottish border, and obviously out to Spain. So it was quite uh, an empire um, as well. So what they did is they sent out these Pandex, and Justinian wanted the Pandex to report back to the legalists, the jurists, if you will, of their day, and document what was the law not what is Roman law, because they know what that is. What was, the Ro what was the practice, the legal practice amongst these various tribes, including and especially the Germanic tribes? And what they did is they created a code, which was an amalgam of both Roman civil law and the Pandex documentation of legal practice in these very, among these various tribes. And this Code of Justinian not only uh, survived, it, it thrived. And some of our legal tradition comes from that same exact Code of Justinian. Because we have evidence of civil law today in our system. If you go back in time to uh, early New York law, we went back when it was a colony, we were uh, critically influenced by the Dutch. The Dutch were the first European settlers in the area. And we all know the handover of uh, Manhattan from the uh, Dutch to the British. But um, property law today still has very strong Dutch roots. And obviously, um, British law came to common law, uh, English law came to dominate in the area. But there's evidence of civil law system everywhere. In fact, in our present day system, you see it not only in certain property laws, but you see it also in the Spanish laws that took root in Texas and California, New Mexico and Arizona and Nevada and the like. But also you see it in specifically the state of Louisiana. Now, Louisiana was based on the Code Napoleon, the, the French Code of Napoleon, which was in turn premised on the Code of Justinian. So today, even today, in Louisiana, if you study law, you're more likely, three quarters of the time more likely, to study civil law 
than you are to study common law. And the major universities in Louisiana uh, teach both, but they teach with a heavy emphasis on civil law, the Code of Justinian. Now, the other major root, if you will, of our practice is the English tradition. And I'm very specific saying English. I'm a Scottish nationalist, so if I meant to say British, I would have. It's an English tradition. Because in Scotland, uh, they were influenced by Roman law from France again, and they have a civil law system as well. The only uh, territory, the only area that became dominated by common law was England. And of course, England was at the root of the British Empire. So the English common law system you can find everywhere in the world where the British Empire dominated and planted a settlement colony like the United States, like Canada, like Australia, New Zealand, India, parts of Africa, and the like. Now, where did the common law system come from? Well, it rose out of the power of William the Conqueror, otherwise known as William the Norman, and that's the gentleman to the lower right. In 1066, he set out to conquer what is present-day England. And when he landed in England with his Norman troops, he came from Normandy, northern France. And of course, he's bathed in what tradition? Civil law. So what he did, quite similar to Justinian, he tried to create a legal order and a tax order and a political order and a power order all in one. And one way to do it was to deal with existing legal systems in the area. Now, who did the Normans confront? Well, the largest population in what is now England were the Angles and the Saxons. Angles came basically from what is present day Denmark, southern Denmark, and the Saxons came from what is present day Norman, northern Germany. And they had pre-existed, obviously, the Normans. Um, they were there with the Scots, the Picts, the Irish, and the like. Um, what they had uh, set up were Shire governments, S-H-I-R-E. And you see it today, Lancashire is Lancashire, Yorkshire, um, Lincolnshire, Leicester is actually um, a derivation. All of these place names, all of these areas were dominated by the Anglo-Saxons. In fact, our language is a mixture of Anglo-Saxon with Norman, and that's where we get English from, Anglo-Saxon. Okay. Now, his power rose, and what he did is he basically had individuals document what is the legal precedent in these various shires. And what he created in England was an amalgamation of Anglo law, Saxon law, uh, English uh, law that he created, Norman law, a little bit of Roman law, uh, a little bit of Celtic law. He created an amalgam, if you will. And at the root of this amalgam was the policy of stare decisis. Stare decisis, stare decisis, the reason why I keep uh, uh, using different pronunciations is because I've heard various pronunciations. I'm not sure. Uh, I've heard legal scholars say it in many different ways. Stare decisis literally means let the decision stand. It's a policy. It's not a hard and fast rule because out of stare decisis, the end result is precedent. Now, what is precedent? It's basically the policy of stare decisis. It basically says, given the same facts uh, and the same issue, incident, you should come up with a similar solution. Understand? Same facts, same legal issue, same solution. Because what they don't rely on, what the common law system does not rely on, is a code like Justinian. You can't look up offenses in a big book and come up with uh, what the punishments should be. The common law system looks at traditional practice, looks at practice in the past, and that's because the process of stare decisis gives you precedent. Now, I said it's a policy, 
not a hard and fast rule. It's more, more not, uh, I can't even say that. Uh, it's probably likely that given the same facts and the same legal issue, you're going to get the same result. But at times, precedent might be changed. New precedent might be struck. And in a way, stare decisis as a policy gives us the flexibility of change over time. New technology, new understanding of the legal issue and the like. For instance, the old precedent uh, with money and banking could not deal with ATMs, with quick banks. They couldn't deal with the idea that somehow you withdrew money when the bank was closed and you have a receipt that isn't quite testament of the money you actually have or that you withdrew. If you ever get one of those receipts when you withdraw money, it'll have a little testament at the bottom saying, you know, the real bank records are kept by the bank. This is in lieu of that. You know, you cannot, uh, this is not proof positive, whatever, whatever. Okay? Because this is money in banking changing precedent. And it takes a little while. It takes a little while to, to uh, deal with it. A, a famous or infamous situation was the issue of zygotes. You know, when you take an egg and a, a sperm and you mix them, you get a zygote. This is getting very scientific now, I, I, I realize. What they do then is they fr freeze the zygote and they can implant the zygote uh, whenever the partners wish. And frozen embryos, you know, we know this technology, but it's a relatively new technology. And law took some time to catch up with the technology. Precedent had to be changed because the only area of law that made sense for this situation where you own something, it's yours, but you give it up to someone else with the expectation of getting it back was the area of law known as bailment, B-A-I-L-M-E-N-T. And bailment is most known for hat checks and coat checks. You know, when you go to a fancy restaurant, you check your hat and your coat, and they give you a little slip, a little ticket. And when you're done with your dinner or the performance or whatever, you give the ticket with the expectation of getting your hat and coat back. Well, that was the only area of law that seemed to fit initially the area of frozen zygotes. And it took time for law to catch up with science. Okay. Now, the other major aspect of our common law system is a jury trial. In the Code of Justinian, Trial was typically done by a singular or impaneled group of judges. It was their job to listen to the facts and look up in the big book exactly what the penalty should be and give you the penalty. Common law system, the emphasis on a jury trial, let individuals like the defendant listen to what happened, what the defendant might have done, or the, def you know, the defendant, uh, the respondent, and then decide whether that makes sense. Did the defendant have another choice? And that's where the jury trial comes in. And the way to get to a jury of similarly situated jurors is through what's known as the voir dire process. You could see the Norman roots of the English tradition. Voir dire is a French word, a Norman word, which means... Um, to see, to say. And what you do in a voir dire process is you get both attorneys and the judge and the potential jurists and you ask them a series of questions to gauge whether the individual is also prejudging the defendant. Prejudice. Prejudging. Now, a certain amount of prejudging is allowed, but it should prejudge that the prosecution is incorrect. Um, the simple fact is a jury trial is a representation of people who are chosen by the state and the defendant to try the case. The judge will inform the jury as to the law and the jury will decide whether the facts of the case fit the law. Understand? So the jury trial, again, gives us a great amount of flexibility, especially when precedent might change. If science changes, 
scientific perspective might change. Thus, the jury that's impaneled, their viewpoint might change to reflect the change in science or environment or politics or society or all those other things that change over time. So the common law system, interestingly enough, I mean, it dates back to 1066 and the Code of Justinian back to right before Christ. But the jury trial precedent in the policy of stare decisis makes the common law legal system as new and as fresh as the last precedent, the last new precedent. So if you could pick an area of law that's changing as we speak, perhaps uh, the rights of non-combatants, the rights of combatants, the rights of enemy combatants. This is a fresh new area of law, only, what, 10, 15 years old. So that's how new the common law system is in our country, how we view, for instance, enemy combatants. See? So while at the same time it's a very old system, 1066, it's very new. So what's our present system? Well, our present system is a mixture of both. In uh, Whenever you go to a code like the Penal Code or the EPTL, the Estates Planning and Trust Law that has to do with wills, trusts, and estates, every time you go to a code, you go to the UCC for you business people, Uniform Commercial Code. Every time you go to a code, you tend to be in the civil law realm. Whenever you go to a jury or ask what's the precedent or look up what is the new precedent or make an argument to change precedent, you're in the common law system. So certain areas of law, like torts, are dominated by common law. Well, other areas of law, like property, are dominated by the civil law system. And then some areas, like contracts, is a balance of both. Criminal law is a balance of both. Right? Uh, rape. We will look into the facts and then apply the law to jury. Common law. But statutory rape, raping a person under the age of consent, 16, 17, depending on the relationship, civil law system kicks in. Mandatory sentencing. Code. Civil law system. So the interesting thing about American law and other systems have it similar to ours, Canada does. They tend to dominate and have a more dominant civil law than us. But uh, other systems are like us. And it's a, an incredible flexibility that comes into the legal mind that dates back to 1066 or 300 B.C. Now, since our system is dominated more by the common law, I want to um, go back again in time to the origins of the common law system. Well, it all started, like I said, in 1066. That's another picture, probably a better picture, of uh, William the Norman or William the Conqueror. And in 1066, when he landed, he standardized local Saxon Shire law. That's not easy to say five times fast. Saxon Shire law to collect rent. He wanted to establish ownership. He wanted to settle disputes among the Saxons, Angles, Celts, Celts, uh, Welsh, Normans, and whoever else, Vikings, uh, that found themselves in what is present-day England. He had something to go on. And that was a book known as the Doomsday Book. I love that title, Doomsday Book. It sounds like uh, something onerous, like you crack it open and dust and devils come out. But the Doomsday Book was created in around 890. And basically what it is, and you can see it down to the lower right, it was a ledger of who owned what land. And it laid it out. This parcel of land is owned by so-and-so. This parcel of land is owned by so-and-so. So what the Norman king could do is go back to the Saxon document and determine who owned what land and how much the tax should be on it. And he cemented that ultimately the king owns all the land. And in a sense, the individuals could own it as long as they pay rent on it. And what do you hear here? Well, you hear the beginnings of a feudalistic system, right? 
the king, the knights, the whatever, the under knights, the half a night, you know, the long weekend. Uh, no, I'm kidding. But you could see a feudal system being created at the bottom of the serfs, right? And the serfs were renowned for not owning land, okay? So all the land owning was distributed then through the monarchy. The way to do that then, what he did by doing that is create a structure, a pyramid structure of power and thus um, expand his control over all of what is present-day England. Now, let's, let's fast forward to Henry II. And he began the takeover of all the local Saxon courts. While Norm, the Norman king was allowing these courts to continue, Henry II wanted to start to take these over, make one standard legal system for the whole country. And the way he did it was that if you were to bring a case in front of any court in England, you had to first get a writ of right. You have to go to um, the king's litigant, the king's jurist, and get permission to bring a legal cause against another party. This was a way for the monarchy to be informed of what are the legal disputes in the country. But it was also a way to collect a very small tax to bring a legal case forward. This writ of right had to be obtained first. Now, this is around 11, uh, no, excuse me, about almost 1,200. This is incredible because this tradition still lasts today. It's not a form of a tax, even though there are court fees. But it, it today is known as a jurisdictional claim. Every legal action, whether criminal or civil, in the United States, besides identifying the parties in the litigation, the first argument that's made in any moving paper, in any appeal, is I have the right to bring suit before this court. The first thing you tell the court where you're bringing the legal suit is you're telling that court they're the correct place to bring legal suit. And this is the writ of right. This is the modern version of the writ of right. So what is old is new again, as new as five seconds ago in some court in the United States. Okay? Now, there were problems with this system. The problems of the early courts, uh, common law system included what law should apply. Should it be Norman law? Should it be the Code of Justinian? Should it be Saxon Shire law? Should it be Angles courts law? Should it be Celtic law? Should it be Welsh law? So there was a real problem initially as to what law should apply. Now, the Roman codes and then what eventually Henry II <coughs> and King William created the tradition built upon tradition. The problem is bad custom followed good custom. So that's obviously a problem of following custom. Not only the good decisions were followed, but the bad decisions were followed and perpetuated over time. And you've got to remember something very important here. We're dealing with an illiterate society. The only few people who could read and write were the monarchy some of the priests, and maybe some of the knights. But there wasn't, quote-unquote, scholarship to speak of. And if there was any, it wasn't widespread. So a lot of the early common law system relied on the oral tradition. Now, we find these systems of legality existing in Western, Af Western Africa. You know, the, the, uh, the griot, they're called. And these are the keepers of oral tradition. Now, here's the problem. How do you set a standard of a decision? How do you mark a decision for time? Well, the way they used to do it was quite creative and also quite vicious. If there was, say, a property transference to go on, they would bring the parties to the land. They would invite, well, not invite, kind of, um, harass uh, the youngest about five six year old not too young because they have to remember this uh, and also remember uh, crib death was tremendous you know the death of uh, children was tremendous so they wanted to make sure the person would live to the ripe old age of 45 
okay? Uh, and uh, what they would do is have this child witness the transference and then beat the hell out of the kid or cut his ear or chop off a piece of finger and tell them what you just witnessed, this is to remind you. So what happened is if there was any dispute as to what happened, they'd bring this child who's probably an adult now into court and, uh, you know, if they beat him too hard, he wouldn't remember anything. But, yeah, they did this. Even today, or not today, they changed this. About 1850, they finally changed it. When you transferred property, you used to have to go to the property with the buyer. And the owner of it, the seller, had to take a clump of the earth and clap hands with the buyer and transfer the dirt. Seriously. They had to transfer the dirt. Can you imagine... The buyer in uh, Dubai uh, wants to buy an estate in Kent, and they have to fly to clap hands with some dirt on it. Okay, it's not practical anymore. That precedent is no more. Now, around 1250, there was a jurist, a you know, jurist of his day named Henri de Blacton, and in 1250, he created a treatise of all the idea, and in his idea. What were the good decisions? And he wrote it down in a book. He wrote all the, to help correct the judge's memory. He helped develop um, a book of practices, good practices of legal thinking. He thus developed the, the modern concept of case law. Because the way he pointed out the good decisions was that he pointed to cases and wrote the cases down in the book. And students of law studied the book to understand good decisions. Well, thank only the Black Tom for your $126 book, $162 book, whatever it is, because that's exactly what you're doing now. You're studying from a book where there are good decisions that point out the law. Case law method is what we call it, and it's alive and well and living in every law school and pre-law program. He also developed the emphasis on two systems of law, a civil law system and a criminal law system, and that the two systems should never mix. Like, there's civil charges and there's criminal charges. Okay, And he began the emphasis of legal reasoning to be taken from precedent. What is the precedent from the case? What should we take from this? What is the legal precedent? And emphasis on precedent. Now, like I said before, how new is common law? Well, it's new as the last new precedent. So instead of saying it's as old as 1066, that's true. But it's as new as 2014. Because if there is new precedent set, that is now new common law. So it's both old and young. All right. Let's look at then some of the key concepts, and some of this will be review. Some key common law concepts. The first is the stare decisis, the let the decision stand. Remember, this is a policy because a policy can be changed. And stare decisis' result, precedent, is changed over time. So let the decision stand, but not always. If there's new precedent, it's, it's a reaction to changes in the law, changes in science, changes in sociology, changes in economics, changes in blah, blah, blah. Okay? One other thing, and we're going to be looking at this throughout the semester, is the mandate of ex equo a bono. Ex equo, I should put EX in front of that. EX space equo a bono. Ex equo a bono mandate of most courts. And this is incredibly important. If you say ex equo a bono, you're saying from equity and law. From equity. Equity. I'm not saying equality. You know, they say equal justice under the law. That's a hope, okay? It's not a reality. What you expect is equity. And another word for equity, or another word that we use today, is fairness. 
We want legal decisions to be fair. A bono, we want legal decisions to be from the law. So ex equi bono means from equity and the law. Now, let me give you a couple examples of equitable decisions that aren't legal and legal decisions that aren't fair. Okay? For instance, say I slap somebody in class. Their tooth goes flying out and takes out the eye of somebody sitting next to them. I'm brought to court, right? And the court orders me uh, to repair that one person's tooth and to get the other guy, I don't know, a patch and a parrot or something uh, to help repair the eye. If not, then uh, to give them reasonable accommodation. Okay? That's fair. Because, uh, uh, right? That's fair. I need to place the person, both of them, in a position they would have been had it not been for my action. But you notice... At no time and place has there been a legal decision. Okay? That would not be correct for a court. For me to be forced to dole out money or dole out repairs of people I've injured, the court would first find a bono legally that I was at fault. Okay? Let me change the facts. Well, not let me not change the facts, but let me change the situation. Same deal. I slap someone, tooth comes out, takes the eye out of somebody else. We all go to court. The court uh, judge hears uh, what happened, bangs his or her gavel, and says, I'm guilty. Okay, everybody can leave the court now. Well, we have our legal decision. The poor guy is mumbling, well, your honor, your honor, you know, because he's missing a tooth. And the other guy's trying to find his honor because he can't see him. Okay? That's a legal decision without a fair resolution. Understand? So that's bono without equo. Just like the first example was equo without bono. So most courts have a mandate to rule ex equo a bono from equity and law. And if you want, think of it this way. Equity and law equals justice. Law without equity is not just. Equity without law is not just. Okay? The other part of our key uh, common law concept is the idea that precedent and the replication of similar situations ending up with a similar decision makes law for us predictable, certain, and definite. We have that certainty, that certainty, that definitive aspect, that predictability in a civil law system because that's the big book. You look it up in the big book, okay? And that makes the law predictable, certain, and definite. In the common law system where we don't have a big book, we go to past precedent to get that predictability, that certainty, and that definitive aspect. The final fascinating aspect of common law is that what is the common law? Well, it's also the enactment of legislatures. So, for instance, rape is rape. Statutory rape is something that's added to precedent. There was a belief by legislatures that the victimization, the sexual victimization of the youth was something that legislators had to make sure to try to minimize or limit by giving very stiff sentences. So rape is one thing. Statutory rape, the penalties are much greater because it's rape committed on someone uh, under the age of consent. Not that you can consent to a rape. Uh, I'm not saying that. But the enactment of legislatures become part of precedent. Okay? So precedent is given the same facts or a similar set of facts and a similar relationship between uh, the perpetrator and the victim or the plaintiff and the defendant, you should come up with a similar uh, legal decision. So that if you commit a similar crime or a similar civil disorder, or a civil liability in New York as you do in New Jersey, 
the penalty should be similar. Okay. And finally, judicial review. This is the power of courts, specifically the Supreme Court, but all courts, to review the legality of decisions. Courts, judges, the executive, the legislature are cogs in the political wheel. The courts step in to make sure that they're acting constitutionally. So what is judicial review? It's a form of appeal as to the constitutionality of a piece of legislation or an executive decision or an earlier or lower court's decision. The common use of the word judicial review comes from Marbury versus Madison, where John Marshall, whose picture's right there, created judicial review for all extensive purposes and actually created that the Supreme Court would be the, the be-all and end-all in the decision of judicial review. And that decision was in 1803. And without that decision, the Supreme Court wouldn't be a co-equal branch today. But if you want more information on that, I teach a whole course on that. Uh, the history, uh, basically, um, the American judicial process. Okay, now a little jurisprudence. And this is my approach to jurisprudence. What is jurisprudence? Well, it's legal philosophy. I'm not going to hit you over the head with more philosophy. We had quite a bit in the last two uh, lectures. And I want to start with a poem. It's a very long poem, but I'm only going to give you two stanzas. And it's uh, the six men of, from Hindustan. It goes this way. It was six men from Hindustan to learning much inclined who went to see the elephant, all, although all of them were blind. All the six men were blind. That each by observation might satisfy his mind. That's the first stanza. The last stanza of the long poem is, so often theologic wars, theologic, you know, religious wars, God wars, the disputants I ween, that I understand, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prat on about an elephant not one of them is seen. Prat on is, uh, oh, they talk and talk and talk and talk. You want pratting? Turn on the nightly news and you'll hear commentators prat on every channel. So what happened? You had six blind men from Hindustan, India. Okay. And they went up and they thought they, well, they felt an elephant. That sounds rude. They went up and touched an elephant. And depending on where they touched the elephant, the elephant became that standard of what they touched. Huh? Well, let me show you a picture. There's the elephant. If you went up and touched a trunk, one of them thought it was a snake, that an elephant's now a snake. And they used that kind of standard or or um, structure to understand what an elephant was. Someone else t touched a tusk, and it was a spear. Someone else touched an ear, and it was a fan. Someone touched the legs and their tree trunks. Someone touched the side, and it was a stone wall. And someone, or someone touched the tail and thought it was a rope. There is the result of the six men of Hindustan. Think of law as the elephant. Depending on what you touch of the law determines what you think the law is. Okay? So here are the school the major schools of legal jurisprudence. The first school we've already talked about, positivist jurisprudence. Remember HLA Hart and John Austin. Law is law if it's enforced. If it's not enforced, it's not law. So what, they, what, what part of the elephant do they touch? Enforcement, that element, becomes determinant of whether law is law. Okay? In the latter part of the 19th century, we have the evolution of sociological jurisprudence. And what their emphasis was on, Vorschgeist, the spirit of the people. The spirit of the people. They said the law is not just what's in books 
and they did not like positivist jurisprudence because they thought it was too mechanical. Law is only law if it's enforced. Law has to be something more to the, sociology, the sociological jurisprudence person. It has to be coming out of the spirit of the people, the Voschgeist. So they disputed the law in books and said there was such a thing as living law. And it's not surprising when these sociological jurisprudence types arose. Justice Cordozo, Justice Brandeis, look at the dates. Justice Brandeis, the gentleman to the lower left. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, the gentleman to the lower right. Look at the dates. They were born around the end of the 19th century, middle of the 19th century, and they died early on or towards the middle of the 20th century. What was America going through? This was an important time period. America was changing itself. It was going from an agrarian society of farmers and extended families to industrialized city-dwelling families that were nuclear at best. One parent or two parents and a small set of children. The grandparents were often off to a home or lived for a while back on the farm. Listen to what one gentleman wrote about Justice Cardozo. His, Cardozo's, continual emphasis upon pressing moral values in the law, along with the demands of reason and order and political stability, was original in its wholeness, in its recognition of the inner struggle, of its mediation between the 19th century love of security and a 20th century love of progress. In an era of transition, he, Cardozo, was the great mediator. So the sociological jurisprudence wrote about a time when the spirit of the people were cha was changing drastically from agrarian farm to large urban city dwellers. The next school I want to look at is a group that rose up in the late 60s a time of great turbulence. And that was the legal jurisprudence school known as legal realism. The first thing they did is de-emphasize precedent. They said precedent is an illusion, usually held out by the upper class to hold the lower class in check. Uh, does anybody hear Marxist or socialism here? Okay, uh, little taste, little snippet, right? Not, not so little. The argument was that precedent was an illusion perpetrated by the legal order to keep the little man and woman in their place. The emphasis the legal realists wanted to look at is the empirical basis of decision making. How did a legal decision get done? What did the judge actually do? What did the lawyers actually say? They, their emphasis was not on this illusion known as precedent, but on the empirical, the, uh, not the normative, but the statistical basis of decision making. What actually happened, not what illusions they hid behind, including the illusion of precedent. The major quote unquote writer, well, actually, he was the major writer and legal scholar in this area was Carl Llewellyn, the gentleman you see on the right. Uh, and it branched out. It was very popular in the 60s and 70s. And, and when I got to law school, it was just starting to die off. But it was a very dominant um, uh, school of jurisprudence. The final school I want to look at is political jurisprudence. It really had no real start time or end time. It still dominates in many law schools and more so in political science departments. What it does is reduce law down to public policy. They believe, those who hold to political jurisprudence, that courts fashion public policy. Courts create public policy. They're just like agencies. They're just like administration. They're just like the cogs of government. Now, they might have the illusion of precedent and you know, the gentle golden ray of logic descending down and to be meted out by the individuals in togas sitting on a bench, 
higher than the regular person. They might have these illusions, but they're no more uh, or less part of policy as your local DMV. So the courts to them are clearly political agencies. So, and p trust me, uh, political scientists, most political scientists and most political science departments emphasize this structure. And for those of you in the class or in political science, you might have already heard this, okay? It dominates in uh, um, many political science and some criminal justice departments, okay? So the courts fashion public policy themselves. The problem with this approach is that it gives a very confused mandate to the political scientists when they try to analyze courts. On the one hand, they want to study the court as if they're just another administrative agency. Input, inner workings, output. The black box, as political scientists might call it. But at the same time, when they get to the issue of precedent, they notice that courts surround this dictate. And many of the decisions are based on nothing more than precedent. So they give a very confused approach to the analysis of courts. On the one hand, they want to relegate them to nothing more than a public agency or administrative arm of government. But on the other hand, they can't explain the dominance of precedent in those supposed political actors, the courts, in handing out decisions. Precedent accounts for a goodly three quarters of all legal decisions. I hope this brief review of the Schools of Jurisprudence help and uh, this will also bring to close the political philosophical side of the course. The rest of the course, we go to the law. And this is where you go to university.